So it's almost the end of August. So that means roughly two thirds of the year is over. So today we're gonna give you an update on the Miami market. This is the latest update. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna share with you one of the biggest mistakes people are making on listing prices for homes. And we can get Jade's feedback, feedback from there. And we means Jade. And first of all, Jade, before you come on, I just want to congratulate you for your $14 million plus deal. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Not, not about the customer, but just what you get for $14 million. So the sale of the 14, 14.25 was in Naples. Um, beautiful, brand new uh, home that was actually, this is the, the previous owner built it. Um, so was not necessarily the developer, but did build it and design it. And then my client purchased it from her and she had only lived there for about five to six months. So really brand new. It looked the house looks just like out of a restoration hardware catalog. It's beautiful. Um, I mean, I huge house. When Valerie and I were at the um, at the walkthrough and everything, we would scream across the house, and you couldn't hear um, because it, it it was really big. Two garages uh, on the north and and south end. It was on um, the the address is one four nine. Kajaput. Um, we in Miami, Valerie and I kept calling it Kajiput. Um, but I think that over in Naples, uh, where there's a little bit less Latin influence, uh, they would say Kajaput. Um, it was just under 10,000 square feet, um, five bedrooms, uh, five full baths, three half baths. And um, so 14.25, which seems like a lot, but for 10,000 square feet, that, that's under 1,500 a foot. Um, so if you compare that to something like One Paraiso, which is the building that I live in in Edgewater, that's going to be, and that's a condo building, right? That's roughly around like 1,100, 1,200 a foot. Um, so it's really not, when you think about the size of the house, um, it's really not that crazy in terms of price per square foot um, for, for the area. Um, beautiful house. Um, I mean, it, it, he bought it furnished. It, it, the house speaks for itself when you, when you see the photos, but, um, but really, 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 really beautiful. I think that um, it was just kind of the perfect house waiting for, for our client. So he's very happy. That's awesome. I have two questions for you. One, does that street mean anything? And it's, it's in Spanish, right? No, Valerie and I keep saying that it is, but it, it's actually. Not. <laughs> um, okay. So we call it Kahiput. I I don't know who that is uh, or what that means, but let's look it up. What is it? It's an oil. This says I just. It says that it's a. Or it's a tree. A tree, from the Myrtle family, widespread in Australia. Interesting. So and we got Valerie in the house. Valerie is in the house. She's on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> um, and it, it's kind of, it says kajiput oil is commonly, or kajiput oil is commonly compared to eucalyptus as a result of its refreshing aroma. Okay. Cool. So um, another thing that I wanted to share is, you know, a lot of people have been, um, asking me questions about you, Jade, because a lot of people don't know, a lot of agents will say, we sell properties everywhere, right? And you actually do. I mean, this within the last 30 days, if I'm not mistaken, besides Naples, obviously Miami, you've sold in Miami, mm -hmm. but also Houston, Henderson, Nevada. And can you tell us quickly a little bit about that and how that works? Yeah, so we uh, have agents across the country and across the world um, that we partner with and for the most exclusive and demanding clients um, we'll we'll work really hand in hand with them and, and handle everything you know because if you're work when we're working with clients of that caliber that don't really have the time to be shopping for different agents in different cities we do it for them um, and with our network obviously we have the top of the line uh, agents in, in every city 
um, across the U.S. or virtually every city and, and you know, internationally as well. Um, so for clients of a high level that just don't feel like doing the work because they have too much going on, um, we'll do that for them and handle everything um, for them. And this isn't just like someone handing an, uh, you know, a client to another client, I mean, to another agent. This is like what you watch on Million Dollar Listing for, you know, a certain clientele where Jade, like Ryan Serhant, is flying from New York to LA. Jade is, if you follow her stories, you'll see Valerie and Jade in multiple parts of the country making sure everything is going down the right way. Yeah, so it's not just we're referring it out and, and kind of letting it happen. We we are acting almost as another level uh, in between the client and and whichever agent um, is working with us on, on the, in that city, whether they're buying or selling or whatever it is, um, because the client the clients typically trust and know us, and they just they have that trust. So there's no reason for them to try and find it somewhere else. So we. Um, kind of work as their manager almost um, and work the deal regardless of if it's just a referral and we're not making as, you know, as much as we typically would if they purchase in, in Florida or Miami or Naples. Um, but uh, I think it's important to not just be able to sell in where we sell, but also to be able to handle their real estate needs um, anywhere. Yeah, it's funny because like Vico on the team, he told me when he first started, uh, obviously from New York, just like you, Jade, he said, I want to be the guy. And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, and he said, like, if someone is looking for real estate in Miami, I want to be that guy or if they need a hotel or they need a restaurant or whatever. So you're basically the gal for real estate anywhere, correct? Yeah, essentially. Um, so, and I think that not only with Compass, but also with, you know, just any other company that we know or people that we've worked with. And um, we really do know and talk to and are constantly, you know, in contact with agents all over the country. So that's in country and, and the world. So it's something that I can't stress enough. You know, if you need something in Mexico City or in London or in wherever it is, we have the connection and, and we know and have spoken to the best um, of the best agents. And Valerie is laughing because I said Mexico City. <laughs> I was laughing inside. Yeah. Um, so let's get to today's topic, um, the market, right? We're in the Miami market. And, you know, I, I see like, even though Zillow is inconsistent, I've been seeing like, basically the West Coast is getting decimated. The East Coast is doing relatively well. And Miami what I'm seeing on Zillow um, in the different zip codes is they're saying like Miami is probably going to go up five to five percent appreciation in the next year to I think I saw their Fisher Island was like 16 percent appreciation by next year. And so with that said, Jade, tell me what you're seeing different price points, condos, single family homes. What are you seeing for buyers and for sellers? Um, I think it's normalizing a little bit uh, or a lot of it from what it was. I think people were kind of expecting this huge crash um, and maybe that has happened in other cities, but it hasn't happened here. Um, and it's definitely been this summer has not been the strongest um, in terms of deals getting done. I mean, there are a ton of showings and there's a lot of people looking, um, but as far as deals actually getting done, it's it's definitely um, slower. Uh, I do think it, as we go into August, I, at the end of August and September, just because people are, are moving, you know, coming back and, and kids are starting school and things like that. Um, uh, I think that it will um, pick up again. I don't think it, it's not, it's not going to be what it was. I think that was kind of like a once in a lifetime <clears throat> market um, as far as sellers are concerned, but I do think it, it's more neutral and normalized. Um, I, I think there's, there still isn't really good inventory. Um, so it's, it's kind of strange because you have buyers that are looking around and looking at everything. Um, and when something good, if it's a decent house comes on the market, like a, a decent single family home price correctly, it will sell within, you know, one, one to two weeks, one week, it'll be under contract if it's priced correctly. Um, 
not underpriced, but priced correctly and a good product, it will sell. Um, but um, the craziness of something that's not worth it and a and hundred different offers and blah, 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 that I just think because of the interest rate increase is not there. Um, but again, we do have a higher percentage of cash than most cities in, in the US. It's like 53, 55%. Um, so I, I think that if things are priced correctly, it will sell. Um, I think that a, a lot of the, uh, so it's interesting because typically the rental market is is strong uh, in Miami and stronger than the buy market of the sale market. Uh, and right now, um, the rental market is pretty slow. And I, I feel like the sale market is moving a little bit faster, which is very strange um, for for Miami. We have it's just within the past week started to pick up the rental market. Um, and I think that's just because a lot of people have been traveling um, and, you know, think places they haven't gone or, or wanted to visit or saw during, you know, on Instagram during COVID or something like that. Um, and they're traveling and they're not here. Um, they're in Europe or, or wherever they are. But um, now they're starting to say, okay, I'm coming back in the winter. Okay, I'm coming back in October. I'm coming back in a month. Um, and or the kids are starting school, they're going to university. So um, that's just starting to, to turn. Um, and, uh, but the buy, the sale market has been slower over the summer, um, but that is a typical Miami uh, pattern, I think, and that we haven't had for the past three years over the past three summers because of COVID, because things were so crazy and the interest rates and blah, blah, blah. But I think that now it's 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 a nor, more normal Miami sale and, and rental market and things are just slower in the summer because it's so damn hot. Yeah, I wanted to add a couple of things to that and great analysis, you know, you're because you're showing so many properties each day, you really have a pulse of the market. My pulse is a little bit slower. <laughs> if you see my stories compared to yours, mine are way less about showings because I'm not showing as much. But with that said, um, you know, I've noticed that, you know, you said if something is priced well, it'll sell, it doesn't have to be below market. But I'm seeing if we add even another dimension to that, not just priced well, the house is ready to go, where mm -hmm. it's not like in the past where there were fixer uppers and stuff, because fixer uppers that are priced well, aren't gonna sell that fast in this market, it, it, at least in my experience. Yeah. Um, and um, the other thing is I did, I did some analysis um, for Q2 of this year for $10 million plus properties and both single family home and condos. So there were roughly like 30 plus sales. And so we're talking about interest rates and all that. And, you know, Jade mentioned that we have such a higher percentage of cash sales compared to many parts of the country. So within this, um, this ten million dollar plus um, price range of so homes that sold. Can I take a guess before you say it? Yeah, yeah. So single family homes, what percent were cash? Oh, well, you're gonna say what percent were? I was gonna say overall Q2 of, of this year, it, ten million plus is probably up. That's what I would think. Right. Overall. I think I think you're correct with that. I just because we're talking about so much in in general, and the the stuff I'm talking about is really like that. Mm, let's say just under a million to two and a half, three million. Right, um, right. I do think that higher, you know, five million plus has, has is increasing definitely in Miami overall. So your guess, um, and I know this is like a pop quiz that you shouldn't know the answer of, but um, ten million or more single family home, what percent were sold that were cash? Sixty. Eighty-five percent. Yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty close. And condos. Okay, condos. I'm gonna go ten million plus. Ten million plus condos. I'm gonna say it's sixty. Sixty. Hundred percent. What? <laughs> yep. Oh no way! Okay. Wow. So that makes sense, right? Because people are. There are a couple things with with Florida. First of all, no state income tax. I mean, state tax. And the next thing is when someone has a primary residence in Florida, it's sort of sheltered, right? You can't take it. A lot of people, a lot of 
let's say criminals will come here when they they think they may have issues in the future and it goes to their homestead and they can't really lose it. I'm not an attorney, I'm not an accountant, but that's what I've heard um, from some clients, why people do it. Um, okay, so as far as I wanted to give a tip and um, and then Jade could add whatever she wants to add. So one of the things that people have an issue with are pricing listings. You know, when we have a market that's shifting, a lot of people will look at, at they'll look at, so a seller will look at what's sold recently, then they will say, okay, my house is nicer. Almost everyone will say their house is nicer than the one that's sold. They'll add a few hundred thousand or more, and then they'll list it. And their agent will say, okay, great, you know? The agent typically will try and beat them down a little bit on the price to make it a little bit easier, and they'll get to a number. The problem is buyers don't look that way, right? Jade, if you're looking at a home, and correct me if I'm wrong, say you're seven years older, right? And you're looking for a single family home. Um, that's my best guess. Um, you're looking for this single family home. You're probably going to have a price range. You're probably going to have have beds, baths, probably at least the minimum square footage and probably a lot size. And then some of the other things, maybe you want something updated, not updated. And that's and then you're going to probably pick a few areas and then you're going to see what happens. Once you find a home that you like, then you're going to figure out what to pay for it, right? You're not going to look at previous sales, look at all the comps, do all that, and then try and figure out, okay, based on this comp, I'm going to, I'm going to look based on my criteria. You're going to find out what's on the market. You're going to find out what you like, and then you're going to decide what to, to buy and pay. And the reason I say that is when you look at comps, comps don't mean anything. If you have a market where there's very short inventory, the comp is going to be less than what you want, right? If you're looking for a property and there's obviously other people looking at the pr properties like you, and there are only two available, it's probably going to sell significantly higher than the comp if it's a comparable property. But if you have, if there were 25 properties available, that next one that sells is probably going to be less than the comp. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you're listing a home, pretend you're a buyer, search the areas. I know Jade does this all the time since forever. And you do that. And when you do that, you'll get a better pulse of what a buyer is looking at. If you have the time and you're sort of a, in your mind, if you know you're a difficult seller, ask your agent to show you a few of the comps in person and be open-minded. Don't say yours is better. I did that with a customer once and she said hers was better and hers was way worse. You have to have an open mind to do that. Um, so that's my tip. Um, Jade, what do you have before we wrap it up? So I, I want to add to that about, you know, the listing list being a seller in this market, as we've said, it's, it's a little more of a neutralized market right now. So it's a healthy market. Right. Um, but I can't stress this enough. If, if it's not a multifamily and you're not selling a commercial property, please, please just wait for the tenant to leave. <laughs> Um, I, we tell this to sellers all the time, and we, we have this kind of going on with one of our listings that's coming up, um, which I do believe will sell relatively fast because it's a good price point and a good area. And there's, again, not a lot of inventory in Sacondo, <clears throat> but uh, we had told the sellers a couple times, hey, let's wait for the lease to expire. Um, we can get it cleaned. We can go on the market very strong um, and kind of give it our best foot forward. And um, they spoke amongst themselves, decided to, you know, they wanted to put it on now uh, instead of wait, <clears throat> you know, a couple of weeks. And I don't know if you saw the emails yesterday, but the tenant does not want us to come in and show it. And what, let's say, and we didn't put it live on the market yet because we need to do photos and all of this other marketing stuff that we do. But um, if we had... Um, and those days on market start counting and all of these people are calling us to come see it and we can't get in till that lease is over. Or let's say the tenant gave us one day, but they're, you know, they said they're moving out of the country and the houses or the condos in disarray. 
that leaves a really bad impression, especially when you're first on the market. So let's say now we're at 30 days on the market. Our, our listing price is now more of a suggestion than a um, than kind of a, a rule, so to speak. So if you have a tenant, just wait until they leave. I know you don't want to have the carrying costs of the HOA, but trust me, it will be worth it because at the end of the day, um, you'll it will sell faster without the tenant in there unless it's some kind of multifamily where you're looking at a cap rate. There is that one month of having no tenant will pay off, I would say probably five to 10 times by not having the tenant in there for that month and allowing us to be there every day and allowing us to have it cleaned and allowing us to even have it staged if, if you want to do that. It is so important and it's something that sellers overlook every single time. Yeah, great, great point. Because a lot of times the tenants that are there will try and like screw up the sale. If they're living there month to month in certain cases, they don't want the place to sell and then to have to find a new home that's probably more expensive and well, I mean, move and do all that. Their, it's their house, right? So yeah. Yeah. I know the sellers For are doing sure. they don't want it to hold the carrying cost, but I, I think they're kind of um cutting off their nose in spite of their face and, and not thinking of the bigger picture. And I know it's hard to see go, you know, going forward, but I feel like we should just do a study of some kind to, to prove to, because it's, it's very difficult for sellers to say, okay, I'll, I'll just cover it. I'll cover the HOA. I'll cover the taxes. I'll cover the holding costs for that month and not, um, and not have a tenant in there uh, and not be, you know, have generating any cash flow. But in the end, it will it pay it pays off and it makes everybody's job easier and typically a smoother sale. Yeah, definitely. So before we wrap up, last thing, Jade, what is a pre-construction or a new construction property that you'll mention and then they have to call you to get the the deets on it? Well, I am going to phone a friend. Um, <laughs> we are actually going to be doing this. Why are you looking at me like that? uh we're uh we're going to be doing a youtube video on it today um, oh, okay what is the name of the project that we are doing so they have to wait for the video you do have to wait for the video valerie yeah. what is the name of the project <laughs> it's 14 river district did you hear that? It's 14 River District. So it's a new um, short-term rental property that um, is coming to Riverland. If you've ever seen on the, if you've gone to Sea Spice or anything like that, River Landing, it's behind Brickle. Um, so close to all of like the health centers, like the um, UM, Bascom, Palmer for the for eye surgery and stuff like that. Uh, what? That's where I got my eye surgery. She's left. Uh, and uh, so it's it's uh, Alta developers, and we'll talk about it in the video today. But um, they're the ones that did Quadro in the design district, and I think that it's a uh, the price point is good. The starting price point is is definitely competitive compared to the other pre construction short term rental projects. Um, but I think it's also unique in the sense that um, it's going to be used a lot for. Uh, people coming to Miami uh, to get surgeries and, and things like that. It's going to be a little bit of a different clientele. Nice. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you for being here, giving all your tips. And again, uh, next time I'm going to share that you sold a $20 million property, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> all right. All right bye, awesome. Bye. See you guys. Thanks for watching.